It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Hi, neighbor. Do you know how special you are? That's why genealogy is important, to let you know just that. You're very special. And thank goodness for Genealogy Gems podcast. That's a new addition to the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hi, and welcome to episode 55 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I'm glad to have you here today. It's been a busy couple of weeks, and I missed publishing the last episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast because I was in Mesa, Arizona at the Family History Expo. What a terrific time that was. I taught my Google classes, and I had a booth in the exhibit hall, uh, where I got to meet with listeners like Mark Tucker and Colleen McHugh and Amy Ehrman and a lot of other folks. And I want to welcome all of the new listeners who discovered the show at the conference. I am so glad to have you on board. Everyone in Mesa was so upbeat and fun to talk to. It must just be that beautiful weather down there. It was gorgeous. And for those of you who are new to the show and to podcasts in general, I'm going to be posting two videos in the show notes for this episode. Uh, it'll be from, they'll be familiar to some of you who've been already been listening, but I think they'll help our new listeners out. These videos show you how to subscribe to podcasts and use the show notes and all that good stuff. Uh, to get to the show notes, go to genealogygems.tv and click the link at the top of the page to episode 55. For previous episodes, click the podcast button, which you'll find in the left-hand navigation bar on that homepage at genealogygems.tv and follow the links to the podcast number that you're looking for. This expo was extra special for me because I did a bunch of video interviews for a new venture that Holly Hansen, the president of Family History Expos, and I cooked up called Family History Expo TV. Holly and her team set up a terrific set in a booth in the exhibit hall, and I did lots and lots of interviews with the great speakers and exhibitors that she had at the conference. So watching Family History Expo TV is a lot like having your own video conference. If you were lucky enough to go to the conference, you'll get to see the folks that you may have missed and get some refresher information from those that you did hear. And if you weren't able to attend, this is your chance to get some great tips and ideas from the experts who were there. Now, rather than just talk about their business or their products, we spent time in the interviews talking about their area of expertise. And I think that you'll find that there's a lot of really useful research ideas in these interviews. Everything from Scandinavian research to family history publishing to stories and resources for adoption research to Canadian records. So I know you're going to enjoy these interviews. You can find them at the Family History Expo TV channel at YouTube, or you can just click the link that I'll have in the show notes uh, in this episode number 55 for you that will take you right to the Family History Expo TV YouTube channel. I am really looking forward to the next Family History Expo, which you can put in your calendars. It's going to be in St. George, Utah, February 27th and 28th of 2009. And I'm actually going to be teaching four classes there at that conference. Uh, The first one's going to be Genealogy Podcasts 101 to introduce uh, new folks to podcast resources. And uh, another one, What You Must Know to Save Your Research from Destruction. I did a a long segment on this topic uh, in an episode of the Genealogy Gems Premium And it's all about how to make sure that you have put things in place to ensure that your research is not going to end up in a landfill somewhere uh, when you're gone, but it's going to be preserved and cared for and continue on your family legacy. So lots of great information there. And of course, I'm going to be doing Google, a gold mine of genealogy gems, part one and part two. Uh, which I did over in Mesa, and uh, we'll be doing that again in St. George. 
And while I was there in Mesa, I finally got a chance to sit down and interview Dick Eastman. Dick is always the one doing the interviews and blogging, and I just thought it was about time that I sat him down and got him to tell us his story. He's had a long and successful career in genealogy, and it was fun to hear how he got started with his newsletter and the evolution of the Internet and its effects on the world of genealogy and and learn a little bit about what's in store for Eastman's online genealogy newsletter in the future. And you can hear that interview in its entirety in Episode 5 of my other podcast, which is called Family History, Genealogy Made Easy. I hope if you haven't subscribed to that show yet that you head over to iTunes today and subscribe to it. Just type in Genealogy Made Easy and you'll find it, or even just the term genealogy will pop up. And of course, I will have a link in the show notes of this episode to take you to that podcast. Family History, Genealogy Made Easy has been a lot of fun to do. I love getting to talk to genealogy experts up close and personal. And I also have really gotten a lot out of going through the genealogy research process step by step. It's a a great refresher for me, as well as hopefully will help folks who are new to genealogy to get them started. Uh, it's, It's been a lot of fun. And speaking of fun... I admit it, I have been having some fun on the Genealogy Gems news blog. If you subscribe to the blog, then you probably saw the little genealogy hoedown that I hosted. And if you missed it, well, then you missed a darn good time. I posted a video of me and some of my favorite gals in genealogy doing a little square dancing with a Christmas twist. I can't explain it, so you're just going to have to watch it for yourself. It features um, genealogy blogger Miriam Robbins Midkiff, who was a guest on Family History Genealogy Made Easy, um, the genealogy podcaster Dear Myrtle, and Family Tree Magazine's editor Allison Stacy, and managing editor uh, Diane Haddad, who as soon as she saw the video, she sent me an email and told me that she laughed so hard she cried. So find out for yourself what makes Diane Haddad cry and follow the link to the genealogy hoedown in the show notes. And wait until you see the cartwheel that Miriam does. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And on the more serious side of blogging, I did actually post some informative things these last few weeks as well. Uh, The big news was Google's launch of the search wiki on November 21st, 2008. And that same day, I wrote about it in my blog post called Genealogists Run, Don't Walk to Google. This search wiki is a researcher's dream. You can now toss results out that aren't pertinent to your research. You can prioritize the results to reflect the approach that you're taking to the research. And you can make notes along the way for each search result to help you track what you've covered, what you've found, and what you still want to do on that website. It's awesome, and I really hope that you will indeed run to that blog post and get up to speed on Google's new search wiki, because it is going to save you a lot of time and a lot of effort. And in other news this week, Family Search announced a partnership with the Houston Public Library, which I talked about in my November 24th, 2008 blog post called Houston Public Library's Fantastic Collection Coming Online. I got a chance to interview Susan Kaufman, the manager of Houston's Public Library's Clayton Library Center for Genealogical Research, in the October 2008 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast, which I also host. And I'll have a link to that blog post about Family Search. And of course, there's been a lot of news coming out of uh, Family Search, as well as Ancestry.com. Most recently, on November 20th, Ancestry announced that they added to their U.S. city directories database. They've had uh, thousands of city directories on their site for a long time, But lots of these databases haven't had any digital images. Well, with this new release, they've added 50 million names in 1,100 city directories from 45 states and Washington, D.C. 
Sounds terrific. Um, this includes directories concentrated around the year 1890, which means this database is uh, possibly a great substitute for the 1890 census if you're looking for folks in that time frame. And the database now has high-quality, grayscale images that are supposed to be much clearer than their previous images. And best of all, they plan to add thousands more city directories to the collection over the next several months. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. I will have a link in the show notes uh, for this 55th episode so that you can search the U.S. City Directories database at Ancestry.com. So if you're signed up for the free Genealogy Gems podcast newsletter, um, you will always find all of the blog postings um, that are most current. You'll find them in the right-hand sidebar of the newsletter each time that comes out. And it's really easy to sign up it for the newsletter if you haven't already. Just head over to genealogygems.tv and click on the sign up button, which you will find in the upper left hand corner of the home page. It's real quick and easy. And calling all Norwegian researchers. Guess what's going to happen starting in the first week of December 2008? The folks at Family Search are going to start indexing the 1875 Norway census. I think I hear some hoots and hollers out there. <laughs> well, although it's not going to be the entire census, it will have a large segment of the census from rural areas of Norway. Uh, family Search's historical family reconstitution unit has joined forces with a university in Norway to complete this project. But don't fret about them not including the urban areas because the university is indexing the census records for the larger cities of Norway. So keep an eye out on Family Search. And although I can't pronounce the name of the university, uh, I will have the name of it in the show notes so that you'll know where to look for those urban area records. And if you or anyone else you know are interested in Norwegian genealogical research, you can help with this project by volunteering as a Family Search indexer. And I tell you, those folks at Family Search are busy, busy, busy. Uh, on November 25th, 2008, they announced that they have completed several more projects in the past two weeks. So very shortly, you should be able to search these online at the Family Search Record Search. Um, they've got the Missouri 1870 U.S. Census for you, uh, the Tennessee 1870 U.S. Census, and the Alabama 1920 U.S. Federal Census. They also have Arkansas marriages. Uh, it looks like a, a part two, which I need to comb through those because I've got several Arkansas marriages to be looking for. And they have the Alabama 1850 U.S. Federal Census. Well, coming up next, we are going to head to the mailbox. As you'll remember, in episode 54, I shared with you some photos of the women in Lee Drew's life who are creating family traditions and heirlooms with their sewing needles. Well, I have a follow-up email here from Lee saying that one of the nuts in their family tree that he referred to arrived on Saturday, the day before I published the episode. Uh, so congratulations to Connie and Lee Drew on their brand new grandbaby. And I know that Connie will be quickly adding the new nut to their family tree wall hanging. Oh, I can't wait to be a grandma. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> How exciting. And premium listener Phil Hayes wrote in to say that he's launching a new website called Serious Genealogy, and that's S-I-R-I-U-S, Genealogy. He says it's a new genealogy website with a focus on using today's technology and documenting a family's history. It looks like he's starting up a message board on the site for discussion about technology and genealogy, and you can find that at SeriousGenealogy.com. And I'll have a link for that in the show notes. And Phil also wrote in to say that after watching my video series on iGoogle and Google Gadgets, which is part of the Genealogy Gems premium membership, he became really motivated and he decided to try his hand at making some genealogical Google Gadgets of his own. 
So Phil has made several gadgets, and he's offering those up to all of us to use. He has the age difference calculator, and he also has a Google gadget uh, for the, the Google newspaper archives search. Uh, he has the serious people finder, a custom search of selected genealogy sites. And finally, he has a tombstone calculator gadget. So you'll want to check those out. And, and Phil, I am thrilled that the premium videos inspired you to create these because I think a lot of listeners out there who use iGoogle are going to find them useful. So again, I'll have all the gadgets uh, with the links for them listed in the show notes. Profile America, Friday, December 5th. The holiday season gets in full swing this weekend with decorations and special events all across the country. Leadville, Colorado, stages its annual Victorian Christmas home tour and Miner's Ball. A quarter of a million people are expected to take in the spectacular Fantasy of Lights display in Wichita Falls, Texas. In New Gloucester, Maine, the Shaker Christmas Fair will feature home-baked goods. And in El Centro, California, Santa will arrive in a stagecoach. At the same time, in stores all over the nation, nearly three and a half million salespersons from upscale boutiques to big chain stores are bracing for the rush of shoppers. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Hi there, this is Lisa Cook of Family History, Genealogy Made Easy. Have you ever wondered who your ancestors were? Finding your family history has never been easier or more rewarding. Get the tools that will deliver success along with inspiring stories of family discovery on my weekly show, Family History, Genealogy Made Easy, on personallifemedia.com. Well, I am sitting here on a wood block of some type here in the FGS Conference Hall here in Philadelphia with Kurt Witcher, not a bad companion to hang out with for a few minutes and watch the folks scurrying and trying to decide where they're going to go in the next class. Um, Kurt, I just sat in on your um, terrific presentation. I had a full audience. They were jazzed about it. And it was all about stuff, (laughs) all the good stuff, maybe some stuff we've missed. And um, tell us specifically what kind of stuff you were focusing on. Well, we were focusing on all of the stuff, to use, to use that term, that was created historically around the federal population schedule. When people hear census, they automatically think of population schedules. But as, as we discussed last hour, that there's more, way more than just federal population schedules. There's agricultural and manufacturing and mortality and veterans. And, and then we kind of ended the hour just kind of showing people how many other types of enumerations there are, sort of under that banner of all that other stuff. Because if you just think of federal population schedules as your only census record, you're missing so many possible records from all of the non-population schedules that were taken in conjunction with the census records, with the population schedules, but all those other enumerations. And when people think census, I would like them to think, you know, enumeration of all kinds, local, state, federal, and you can find some amazing information as we saw during the presentation. You know, most of us have run across an agricultural right. enumeration, right. and um, sometimes the business ones. And I guess it's because they're tacked on to the end of a population schedule. And I started thinking, now, why is it I've missed some of these? And um, I'm guessing it's because they're not easily accessed through Ancestry or Heritage Quest. Am I, am I correct on that? You are. Uh, and, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, uh, the exciting thing about the, the 21st century is that so many people have come to genealogy over the web. Um, yes. we, we jokingly call them, you know, the born digital genealogists. I mean, <laughs> they, they haven't come to seminars or, or workshops. They've come to genealogy uh, through things like podcasts and sure. blogs and, and, and really large sites like Ancestry. Um, the sort of, you know, maybe small downside to that is if information aggregators like Ancestry don't put them out there on their websites, then people don't know about them. And you don't they, and they know don't what you don't know. Exactly. 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 That's and, and the perfect. world of, of resources 
looks a bit narrower, and boy, did you just kind of blow the ceiling off of that for everybody. I could see the eyes opening and saying, whoa, I thought I understood what was out there, and I think I've missed a few things. Right. And um, I think you mentioned about seven different ones, um, and not every one of them has a name, but there was quite a variety of information. Uh, one of them even had signatures, which yes. I love. You know, you were, you were saying, made a comment about, oh, there's some folks who love to collect, you know, the signatures. I'm one of them. I think, that, I think that's fun. It's just a lot of fun on top of it. Yeah. So um, maybe you could just touch on some of those differences and the fact that not each, you know, every enumeration is different, isn't it? It, it really is. And um, yeah. what we joked about during the session, you know, uh, we all... Most of us like CSI, you know. We, yeah. we like to show the crime <laughs> scene investigators. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in many ways, those same forensic, evaluative, evidence gathering skills are what we do as, as exactly. family historians. And if we can think about population schedules and census records as enumerations and kind of put on our CSI mindset, well, we're really trying to find not just one, but as many enumerations as we can, then we get more leads. We can find mm-hmm. more records. Um, a couple of the ones that we looked at, the social schedules, for example, they, they don't list a single name on the social schedules, mm-hmm. but you know all the taxes that are collected. So now you know, okay, if I go to the courthouse and I'm looking for tax records, I know for this county I should find you know these three or four types of tax records. If we're doing research in a county, the social schedules tell us what newspapers were published, whether they that were weekly or yes. monthly. They tell us all the denominations that are represented <laughs> in that county and how many churches there were. So if we're pretty certain our ancestors were Lutheran or were Baptist, well, we know that there's a finite number. There's two Baptist churches in, in this, and then we can set out finding, okay, which ones were they? Uh, where were they? Uh, are there any records? Uh, and that that's remain? funny. It made me think of brick walls. We think we have brick walls, and I tend to think maybe they're a little more artificial than we thought because we we found the records that had the names and the dates and the places, but we skimmed over the records that just had tick marks or, exactly. you know, newspaper exactly or whatever. Right. Exactly. And those were chocked full, the way you showed them to us, of clues to help us break the brick wall because they're going to send us different directions than we would have known to look. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you mentioned brick walls. I don't know how, how everyone else uh, you know, deals with or feels about their research, but to me, the thing that scares me or frightens me the most is running into a brick wall or coming to a dead end and really having no real clues about where to go so i like the methodological sort of the old stubborn german approach of just you know (laughs) slow but steady you know just try to mine every document for as many clues and pieces of evidence that you possibly can and and these non-population enumerations are golden for doing that particularly if you try to find all of them that exist. I'm guessing with your mindset, you don't have as many brick walls as the rest of us do because there's you're never really quite to the end of the right. corridor. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you have too many different uh, hallways you're looking right. down. Right. Um, so maybe you can, uh, hopefully we've excited people to understand that there are a variety. I'll have um, the major headings on the show notes for this podcast so that people will know what you refer to besides just population. Where would they go to look to find these records? Well, the, 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 the first best place to get just a general flavor for their time period, their state, and their county, uh, three great places. One is to go to the National Archives website, and they can just plug into any browser, archives, plural, archives.gov, and oh, boom, it'll okay. take them right to the National Archives website, and look for census headings on their website. They give great downloadable explanations about not just the population schedule, okay. but all of the non-population schedules. And th- they give some treatment in some instances to state census records. Okay. Uh, but generally it's just the federal records. second great place to look are the holdings, and, and, and all of them are online. State Library, State Archives, State Historical Society. Those right. three are, are your second tier. Um, state Archives and State Libraries oftentimes have copies of the state census schedules as well as the federal ones, but th- those special state enumerations. Those state ones that happened that fell between, between the decades, exactly. I love that. Exactly. Particularly you showed an, an example of 1895. Oh, it makes you realize, that's right, that's right, we're not right. out of luck because 1890 burned. Exactly. So, okay. Exactly. So state archives. Uh, and, and state libraries will oftentimes have, you know, references to an actual list of those, what I call the really special enumerations, um, as well as state archives. They'll have microfilm of the 
uh, dog licenses, uh, depending upon what state codes were in particular areas and time periods, you know, you, you'll have an enumeration of physicians, you'll have an enumeration of taverns keepers, you'll have mm-hmm. an enumeration of individuals who receive bounty for wolf pelts. I mean, <laughs> amazing. Wow, amazing. what a variety. Right. Well, th- this has just been a ton of fun. I'm so glad I-, I snuck into your class and got myself a seat. It was a full house. Um, but, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us on the show. And um, maybe last thing, did you have any suggestions on articles or books or things to point listeners to to learn more about these unique and very special uh, enumerations? Ancestry's The Source has a great chapter on census records that really covers the waterfront on all these different types of enumerations. We've been trying to coax them to make that electronic. Oh, yeah. So on their website, we could find that much more easily. Also, if you go to the National Genealogical Society has published a number of records, and the National Genealogical Society quarterly has been, you know, the the profession standard for a long time on these methodology articles, and a number of census articles over the years have been published in that quarterly, as well as case studies on how people have used these special enumerations, too. So if you you look at them and you go, "Uh uh-oh, they still look like tick marks to me, you could go and read a case study and maybe then see how somebody turned that into something viable. Absolutely. Kurt, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Profile America, Tuesday, December 9th. Throughout history, bachelors have had to put up with a lot of good-natured kidding from friends and family. They tend to be stereotyped, and many television sitcoms deal with their supposedly hapless lives. But no insult can rival that enacted in Missouri this month in 1820, when the legislature voted to tax bachelors between the ages of 21 and 50 one dollar a year just for being unmarried. Obviously, the tax did not stand the test of time or legality. Today, about 29% of all males have never been married, compared to 22% of females. Together, they total just over 55 million people. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, you know, as strange as the Missouri tax from 1820 sounds, this was not an isolated incident of taxing unmarried men. The state of New Jersey had a little fun with the idea of taxing bachelors back in February of 1898. And uh, I actually have a clipping here from a newspaper, February 10th of 1898 from the New York Times. It says, The members of the House had fun today with Mr. Welter's bill taxing bachelors $2 a year. Mr. Losh, one of the rural members, was in the chair. Mr. Porter offered an amendment to tax also old maids. This Mr. Losh declared carried, and then Mr. Porter started in on a funny speech, which Mr. Losh eventually shut off by declaring Mr. Porter out of order. The bill then went to third reading. The bill is not taken seriously, and there is not the slightest intention of passing it. (laughs) That was from the New Jersey legislature. Well, even though New Jersey didn't go through with it, Germany was making news all the way in New Zealand, where it was reported in this article from page two of the Herrera and Norman B. Star newspaper from the 10th of July, 1899. And they reported that uh, over in Germany that they had voted a bachelor tax of 25 cents above taxation imposed on married men. The paper later ran an article in 1906 about the idea of taxing bachelors, saying that it was an old scheme for promoting the greatest happiness of the greatest number. A lady writer has recently proposed an elaboration of the crude idea. Your bachelor, says she, should be taxed mildly in his youth, and with increasing severity for every year that he remains celibate. The heavier his tax, it goes on to say, the more difficult the unhappy bachelor would find it to escape, to which scheme comes as natural pendant a story from a cemetery. With her second husband, a good woman was paying a visit of her first husband, who had been a soldier invalided home from South Africa only to die. Ah, said she, wiping her eyes, if it wasn't for the war, you wouldn't be my husband, Jim. What a curse, said Jim, is war. 
Ouch. <laughs> and finally, the New York Times reported on November 17, 1912, that Prussia was going to tax bachelors. The headline read, All getting $750 a year up will be specially assessed. And according to the article, the Prussians were giving formal and official consideration to a project for taxing bachelors. The original bill has been amended so as to make the tax effective only in the case of unmarried men whose income exceeds $750 a year. The bachelor tax would take the form of an income surtax. I guess the idea of the legislators who were backing the bill was that men who have to support wives or children ought not to be compelled to pay as much toward the support of the state as men who are leading the carefree, irresponsible lives of bachelors. And according to the newspaper, it had a very good chance of becoming law. Hmm. Well, that may explain the high immigration rate in 1912 from Germany to America. (laughs) No, I don't know. But isn't it funny to learn about the times that our ancestors lived in? I mean, who knows? You better check your genealogy database and see if you have a large number of marriages in 1912 amongst your German ancestors. Well, it's that time again to play Name That Tune. As you'll recall, in the last episode, I played this mystery song for you from the old reel-to-reel recording that my husband's grandparents made over 40 years ago. And once again, Jeannie from Illinois had the answer. Hi, this is Jeannie from Illinois again. I just heard your podcast. The tune you're playing is the Dark Tom Strutter's Ball, um, copyrighted in 1917, written by a man named Brooke Shelton. Um, the t- if you don't know the words, I'll be down to get you in a taxi, honey. You better be ready about half past eight. Now, dearie, don't be late. I want to be there when the band starts playing. That's the first part of it. Anyway, uh Enjoy your podcast. Bye. Thank you, Jeannie. And Phil Hayes also emailed me to say that his mom named that tune in just 15 seconds and then proceeded to sing the song to him over the telephone. Phil says that there are over 150 different versions of this song in iTunes. Wow. And it was so cool because I was once again able to pull up the original sheet music from the Library of Congress's American Memory website, uh, which you can see that in the show notes. Phil's mom, who is in her 80s now, is quite a lady. She started playing the piano at the ripe old age of seven years old, and that was back in 1932. Phil has been interviewing her quite a bit lately and wrote a wonderful blog post about his mom at his HayesFamily.us website. And oh my gosh, I mean, I'm looking at this website right now and what a lovely photo of his mom playing the piano. So I'll have a link to uh, his blog in the show notes along with this great photo. And you can even watch Guy Lombardo and the Royal Canadians doing the Dark Town Strutter's Ball in the 1950s. I'll have that video for you as well. And according to the Encyclopedia of Music in Canada, the song was inspired by a ball at the 1915 Pacific Panama Exposition in San Francisco. It was first published on January 18th of 1917, and the version recorded on January 30th of 1917 by the original Dixieland band may very well have been the earliest commercially made jazz record. Hmm. I'm so excited to be able to play not only this tape for the first time this Christmas for the Cook family, but thanks to you guys, I'm going to be able to tell them about the songs that they're hearing. This is terrific. So in this episode, I'm going to play another song in the hopes that you're going to be able to do it again for me. So here we go. Name that tune. If you think you know the name of that song, please email me at genealogygemspodcast 
at gmail.com, or better yet, like Jeannie did, call and leave the answer on the voicemail at 925-272-4021. Well, we've come to the close of another episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I hope you're enjoying this free podcast. It's a lot of fun to bring it to you. And, you know, with the holidays approaching, there's a wonderful way that you can get your online shopping done while supporting this show by accessing websites like Amazon.com through the links on the Genealogy Gems homepage and throughout the website Amazon gives the Genealogy Gems podcast credit for your purchases. Now, it doesn't cost you anything more to do it this way, but by using the links on our website, you can do a lot to help keep the free Genealogy Gems podcast coming to you. So I hope that you'll keep that in mind. There's a couple weeks left now, and I know I've got to get my Amazon order in. So (laughs) anyway, if you can do that through the website, that would be wonderful. We appreciate your support. And I hope that you will visit the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel where you can watch lots of great genealogy themed videos at youtube.com slash user slash genealogy gems. And as always, there's lots of ways to reach me. I love to hear from you. Just email me at genealogy gems podcast at gmail.com. And I hope that you will come on over to Facebook and visit. There are lots of genealogists over there. It's amazing. It's just taken off. And um, I will have a link to my Facebook page in the show notes, as well as we have the Genealogy Gems fan page. And that's a great way to get lots of updates as well about what's going on with the show. And, of course, you can catch up on what's going on in the world of genealogy at the Genealogy Gems news blog. And that's at Genealogy Gems podcast dot blogspot.com or just go to genealogygems.tv and click the blog button and it'll take you right there. So until next time, thank you so much for listening, friend, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>